Funding for the following program has been provided by this station and other public television stations and by a grant from the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My guest tonight is Gail Sondergaard, and that is a name and a face to, uh, to conjure with, both on The Late Show and at film festivals. Uh, Gail Sondergaard usually played uh, a supporting role, but uh, so often she was more memorable than what she was supporting. And the first time they ever gave an Oscar for a supporting actress was in 1936, and there she is with uh, what obviously is Claude Rains. Uh, and she won it for her work in Anthony Adverse. Uh, and then she did one of uh, several vividly nasty roles in Seventh Heaven. Her, her impact as the Eurasian woman in the letter was, all, all, I think, all the more remarkable since she spoke only Chinese. And here she is with Tyrone Power in The Mark of Zorro. And you remember this. That looked to me as her, her typical look, the spider woman. Uh, she impersonated uh, a cat in the Bluebird. With, that's with Shirley Temple. And here she is in another Oriental part, Lady Tiang in uh, Anna or Anna and the King of Siam. And of course, uh, in the Road to Rio, she is on the right, uh, in which she stood in some fairly fast company. You may recognize Hope Crosby and Lemoore, among others. Now, despite this uh, remarkable background, Miss Sondergaard refuses to fade into the past. She is in her early 80s. She's still acting. You may have seen her in your city recently in the national tour of the royal family, and she's about to open in New York in a play called Goodbye Fidel. She's working on a book about her life, which is, you're about to find out, has been, I think, as fascinating off screen as on. If you'll welcome then, Gail Sondergaard. <laughs> How are you? Hi. Nice to you. The, the line that I always remember in, uh, I think it was The Road to Rio, the Hope picture, was you're standing at the bottom of the gangplank, and weren't you, weren't you the head of a sinister national or international murder organization or involved with it or some I dastardly thing? I can't remember you those the details of the stories. <laughs> it's really true. I'm sure it it's is. Really You've true. done so many. But I thought you were going to speak about the one where I have an amulet and I'm hold it in front of people and say, I hate you, I loathe you, I despise you, and that then they become uh, mesmerized. That's yes. what I expected. What was... I don't even know what I said at the end of the gang plan. What did what I was... say? You were waiting there, and um, Hope defiantly, uh, you, he was the one you were after, actually. He knew you were evil, so but he didn't know where you remember the story. Anyway, he got down at the bottom of the gangplank, and he saw you standing there, and he said, waiting for your broom. <laughs> and uh, that sounds like Bob Hope. No one ever laughs, and I always think it's hilarious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know. But you, you have been wicked, I would say, more of the time <laughs> than unwicked, haven't well, you, in your you career? I'm glad you said more of the time, because I think you said uh, usually out there, and I said no, not usually. The point That's is, right. I think that I've had more variety, actually, in roles than many, many other actresses in pictures or even on the stage. It's really true. Some people come to me and say, you were always so terrible, I hated you. I said, please, just drop the word always. That's how I feel about it, because I've played many, many kinds of characters. Well, to play, if you'd only played the Spider Woman, probably people would say you were usually <laughs> evil. But, yes, uh, well, I did, I did a number of women. I, I don't uh, deny that I was terrible sometimes, a terrible woman, you know? You know what occurred to me, and you may not remember it either, but it, there was something in which uh, fascinated me as a kid. Mm -hmm. You had an automatic pencil that fired the lead or something into someone. And I think you're thinking of that uh, show you just finished taping. No. <laughs> I remember Only nothing that. like that at all. But I, I swear to you, you do. I could prove it if I could find well, fine. the right. Well, fine. I'd like to know about it. Find the right. <laughs> so I can refute it or believe it. What, what, what is the latest count, would you say, of the number of films you've done? Or well, I think it's around 42 or something like yeah. that, when you really count them all, uh -huh. some of which I would just soon eliminate. But it really isn't true. Some of them I didn't want to do, and I hated doing them, and I really 
rose up and said, please, no more like that. Did you? Yes, I did, but I did them. I did. I was under contract at the last, really, at Universal. Mm -hmm. And I did whatever they assigned to me, including the Spider-Woman Strikes Back, which followed the Spider-Woman, mm -hmm. because um, the Spider-Woman had been so successful, they thought they'd make a series with me starring in them. And mm -hmm. then out came this picture, and I was horrified. I, I hated it. I despised it. I loathed it all of those words. And then when I've seen it recently, I understand that film buffs today think that it's camp. They think I'm marvelous. Sure. And I'm not bad in it, really. So. You decided you're okay in it? Well, I decided I was all right in it, <laughs> right. <laughs> what, what are the ones that really haunt you that you hope no one... Oh, there really aren't any. There's one that a joke is made about by a fan of mine. I don't, I don't even want to tell it because it, it doesn't matter. But some people play tricks on me like that. And when I think they're mm -hmm. going to, uh, uh, I have invited a party of people to come to my home to see, I remember it was one occasion when I, I, want, I invited people to come to see Anna and the King of Siam because it had not been released to television, actually because of the King and I, it wasn't released for quite some years. And he arrives mm -hmm. early and there are a number of guests there already. And he says, I think I better um, try out this, uh, this, this um, uh, what you call a projector and see whether it's going to work here. And he starts showing it, and it is the picture <laughs> that I really oh, don't care about. The one you hate the most. The one. And so, of course, I screamed, and, <laughs> and then he put on Anne and the King of Siam. And you won't tell us what... <laughs> oh, what's the use? No, okay. what's the use? What's the use? Someone is sure to spring it on you again. <laughs> yes, that's right. Were you, were you a bit of a rebel as a child? From what I've been able to gather about your childhood, Well, you I would think I was a rebel, except mm. that... Um, I would think my parents were also, because my parents were very progressive people in everything, you know, uh, came from Denmark when they were teenagers, by each separately, not together, mm -hmm. met in this country. And uh, they had read Henrik Ibsen, and my mother already uh, understood Nora very well and believed that a woman should uh, make her own way and earn her own living and all, all everything, like everything, go down the line. Yeah. This is how they were way ahead of, I don't think it's ahead of their time because their time had a lot of that feeling. Where did you live then? We lived, uh, I was born in Litchfield, Minnesota. Uh -huh. And um, well, we lived there for a few years and then we lived in Philadelphia, just a few years. And then we came back to Minneapolis and from there on I stayed through the University of Minnesota. And then I went out into the world and made my own living. <laughs> and, st and still do. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, yes. Your, your mother was what is known as a, was known as a Lucy Stone. Well, Lucy Stoner is because she believed in a woman keeping her own name, actually. And is that the woman who first defied the... Uh, oh, I can't remember the, the details. Thing, Lucy I should, Stone, is she... The, I should know more about that It was that an organization period. of women, anyway. Mm, well, it was then became called the uh, Lucy Stoner. Uh, maybe there was an organization, but that uh -huh. became a synonymous to believing that you used your own name all the way through. Which is fine. I mean, she just, what she did was give her three daughters a middle name of her last name. <laughs> That's how she solved that. So yours would be? Well, I was born Edith Holm Sundergaard. <laughs> and you say Sundergaard. Well, you want it Danish? Mm hmm. Synagogue. Synagogue? Synagogue. What's interesting? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Copenhagen. <laughs> uh, Instead of Copenhagen. 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 That's very good. There was a, a, a terrible pun done about Lucy Stone, <laughs> Lucy I think Stone. by George S. Kaufman, Lucy because, Stone, I guess it was. because of the fact that they wouldn't um, change their name and were, some, some of the Lucy Stoners were considered very independent of men. Mm -hmm. He made the remark, Lucy, a, a Lucy Stone gathers no boss. <laughs> Get it? B-O-S-S. -S. That's very nice. <laughs> I shouldn't hang that on anyone, but uh, <laughs> actually it's not bad. Mm -hmm. and, and your father was, uh, was deep in butter. Yes, he was deep in butter. <laughs> Can he you explain been, what that means? He'd mean? been uh, trained uh, to learn about butter in Denmark, actually. And when we were children, he was running a creamery. He was making butter in a creamery, which was very exciting. These huge vats and things and the machines going around. And, and he drank buttermilk right out of the churn. And it was charming. Well, is there something about Denmark and butter? They, the best well, yeah, well, it's a dairy country, of course. Huh. And Minnesota was a dairy country. And later on, my father worked for the government as a scorer of butter. He was such an expert. He could put a little lump of butter on his tongue and he would know what was in it. 
you couldn't get away. It would be scored, and 96 would be very high. It meant sweet butter, it meant lots of things. So that it was kind of f fun uh, watching you're, this process. I must say you're the first relative of a butter scorer that I have ever, <laughs> I've ever met. I, sure. I thought in seeing you on the screen that you might be, but I wasn't sure. You did, sure. you suspected. <laughs> yeah. A butter scorer. Butter scorer. And right. you can develop a sensitive tongue enough to the point where you, yeah, you can know whether it's... Evidently could, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You, you saw this miracle performed? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> who, who is... Uh, oh, uh, Sonny, let me ask you about this. Um, the book Ivanhoe. Yes. Played a, yes. a part in your life. Yes, it did. And if it hadn't and been for that novel, you might not be well, that's some truth here to now. That, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how, how this, ever else it would have come about, how, really. How is this possible? You yeah. want to know the story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. My mother was a pianist by talent and talent and talent and desire, but never had a career. And uh, my two sisters went into music, and I was taught piano from on little sticks on a cardboard thing to play games beginning about four and I liked music very much as I still do but I eventually didn't think I wanted to practice anymore and I was sort of the black sheep because um, I didn't go on with music and she was disappointed she didn't chastise me about it she wasn't that kind and then one day when I was in high school uh, we were supposed to read from uh, anything we wanted to choose just read in front of the class and I, decide, I decided to read, and I wish I could tell you what it's about because I haven't read it again <laughs> since then. I don't think anyone has. No, I don't think so either. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I picked out a very emotional scene of Rebecca in the novel Ivanhoe. And I, Ivanhoe, and I stood there uh, reading and enjoying myself tremendously. And I noticed the teacher was standing at the back of the room looking out the window, and I thought, I guess I'm not doing so well, but I didn't care. I went right on reading this thing and emoting and enjoying it. And at the end of the time, the teacher came to me and put her hands, two hands on my shoulders and looked in my eyes with such intensity that I was terrified. She said, have you ever studied dramatic art? I said, no, I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, you must. So I went home and told my mother that the teacher said I must study dramatic art, and she took me to a dramatic school. And that was the beginning. I didn't know it was acting even. It was elocution, it was reading, it was feeling, it was laughter, it was everything. But that was, that was the beginning. I, it probably could have been anything you read. That, that, well, I mean, maybe we so, to, the telephone book, perhaps. You don't have to... <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to see someone do that. Do you read the telephone book? Yeah. Apparently, I, I think... I can't do that anymore. I couldn't see it anymore. <laughs> so don't ask me. Your husband's yes. name was Herbert... Is it pronounced Biberman? Biberman, yes. Biberman, yes. yeah. Yes, uh, And um, scholars of the blacklisting period... Yes which still amazes me whenever everything I read or hear about it. What was the first word you said of the blacklist period? I say, well, well f students of that time oh, student, or scholars, scholars. I thought you said scholars, some, but I couldn't yeah, I didn't, quite. Uh -huh, yes. Odd choice of words. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh -huh. would, would remember him. And now, was he actually one of the so-called uh, Hollywood Ten? That's right, he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Could you was. describe what happened? Uh, oh, heavens no, that, I couldn't uh, begin to describe it's it. It's too all. long a story. <laughs> What? Is it too long a story? Mm, no, I'm impossible to, to describe it. But he, uh, I, I don't mean I don't mean the, uh, this, the entire no, blacklisting phenomenon. No, I know, I know. But uh, in your own life, he was. Well, we, he was a progressive he, man, and mm -hmm. and uh, we had stood for many, many. Well, for instance, uh, the war in Spain, the loyalist side, and all. We were helping to send uh, um, ambulances there, and a lot of American men went there to fight, feeling that it was the beginning of the fascism taking over because Hitler and Mussolini, those, they were already behind it and fighting against a, con a, a government that had been elected by the people and overthrew that elected government and set in a fascist state, you see. And we were aware, we were anti-fascist as some people have called us, you know, because we were thinking in those terms. As far as I was concerned, it was how I was brought up. It was my thinking. I, uh, there was nothing else. I, I couldn't possibly adjust to any other way of thinking except in a progressive way as far as 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 the world was concerned as far as happiness of the human beings in the world was concerned you know so there and came that was very, enough to what? be considered a subversive was it I mean, oh was, yes of yeah. course anybody it, during that that was a bad period and anybody will admit it today that it was an ugly bad period in our yeah. country it was not had nothing to do with our democratic form of government 
and we were all called in front of the Un-American Activities Committee at that time. And uh, the stand that we took, and I was one of them there too, the stand was that it was there, the, the uh, uh, committee was unconstitutional and that they were really uh, stepping and throwing out the First Amendment, which uh, gives everyone the possibility of, of thinking as they wish to think and associating as they wish to associate. And that's what it was all about. It was just a bad period after the war, yeah. which had been, as we all know, a good fascist war. Did he lose a lot of work, your husband, from the... Uh... Well, we didn't work again, either one of us, in pictures for 20 years, actually, when I came back. Is that into... so? Yes, that that's long. right. We were in television and in motion pictures. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was a director and a writer and a producer. And he never stopped working. I mean, he worked, he wrote... And he How did, did a motion picture along with some other blacklisted people called Salt of the Earth, which has become an American classic today. It's one of the most beautiful pictures uh, that I know, really. Simple, lovely story and uh, accused of, you know, being, well, <clears throat> it, was, it was too ugly a time. Let's talk about something else. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the thing that I find amazing, though, is that there are remnants of it still about as recently as within the last few years. Well, yes, uh, uh, it's possible. Uh, I think we make strides. I think that there is always progress. I believe I'm an optimist, you mm -hmm. see. No matter what I hear or what I see going on, I'm still an optimist about, about uh, you know, people really finding out what is best for everybody, not mm -hmm. just a few. You know, this is my philosophy. Have, have you ever <clears throat> run afoul of veterans organizations that seem to still want to no, rake I up those old no, memories? No, I have not. Yeah. No, and, and coming back into my work, I have been greeted with the, what shall I say, great respect. And, and uh, well, it, mm -hmm. it's, it, well, of course, it's a period where we are able to speak again because enough things have happened in yeah. this country to make people say, oh, maybe that's what, you know, Watergate, what's the use of going into it all? Vietnam, Mies, war. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have happened to change people and to make them understand, yeah. you know, some of these things. That, <laughs> that maybe we felt or believed in or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what, when you um, met your husband, what was he doing at the time? Mm -hmm. Well, he had just graduated from the uh, Baker School uh, at Yale. Mm -hmm. And he'd gone to Europe to study for a year, theater. And I had just finished a two-year uh, stint at the Bunstall Stage uh, Stock Company in mm -hmm. Detroit. And we met in the rehearsal room of the Theater Guild of New York City. <laughs> that was our beginning, which I think is, is, is very lovely. It's a good theatrical beginning. Yeah, it's a good theatrical beginning, yeah. uh -huh. yes. Uh, yes. Well, what did he direct that we would know of? Well, first of all, I did mention Salt of the Earth, which was so therefore not a Hollywood yeah. film, uh -huh. but a very, very beautiful film, one that was stopped on every side. It, the story of that is really, really wonderful. To, to know about and to understand, but you don't have to even know the background in order to appreciate the film. What does the so title he, refer to? I've never seen it. Salt of the Earth. Oh, it's a story mm -hmm. about um, Mexican-American miners in uh, Silver City and based on a real story, which mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it, was a, it was a written story. Michael Wilson, the well-known screenwriter who was also blacklisted, wrote it, and uh, Herbert directed it, my husband, and... Uh, uh, it's about the, the strike, actually, which happened, and, and it's written on that. Uh, the strike of the miners, the Mexican-American miners, to get some kind of equality with the Anglo miners mm -hmm. for have running water in their homes and, uh, you know, just uh, sanitary things and other things like that, wages and such. So that's the story and how the women took over the picket line when they were stopped by the Taft-Hartley bill and how the women really won that strike. And therefore, today, it's, it's very popular among the women's groups and, and well, many other people, too, of course. Yeah. But uh, they think that it was ahead of its time because today we have what we call women's lib. <laughs> but yes. when I was a child, we had women's suffrage, you see, so that it's progress. Mm -hmm. How active are you in, in women's I'm not active at all in anything except my work. <laughs> that's all? That's, well, right now, that's all I, yeah. I really have the energy to do. Well, you, when your husband picked up to go to Hollywood from New York, mm. did that mean the loss of your theatrical well, career? Well, I thought it did when I said, I will follow thee, my husband, <laughs> and yeah. I will not go. I was already playing leads on Broadway, and... Uh, only playing leads? What? Did you say I was only playing leads? No, I was already, already yeah. playing leads on mm -hmm. Broadway. I had uh, filled in in Strange Interlude. I had done 
some very exciting and interesting things, but I didn't think I belonged in motion pictures. That, that I was sure of, that I had not even answered some of the things that had come up when I was in Strange Interlude asking, and I didn't even answer the letters that asked me. I didn't, I didn't belong. I knew I didn't belong in motion pictures. So I said, if you're going to Hollywood, I'm going too. And this was a big, big thing for me to say because my, my career had always been the core of my being, you know. Mm. And I went with him, and for six months I had a marvelous time. I'm an outdoor gal. I went to the mountains and the ocean and beaches and lakes and had a gorgeous time mm -hmm. outdoors, you know, rode horseback and so on and so forth. Well, what lured you into the movies well, if you were so dead Well, there was a young man there in, the, in an agency that my husband had been assigned to by his New York agent. And he kept saying, let me take you around, let me take you around. You're an actress. And I said, no, I don't belong in motion pictures. That's, that's, forget it. And then he came to me one day and he said, uh, well, look, they're doing a, a film called Anthony Adverse, and uh, they, they, they want an unknown face, and Mervyn Leroy insists he wants an unknown face. They thought about Betty Davis doing it, but it's not the big star role, and, and they want an unknown face. Would you at least come to meet Mervyn Leroy? And I said, well, I, I'd be glad to meet Mervyn Leroy, but I, and he finished the sentence, you see. So uh, Mervyn Leroy later told me that as I walked through the door with some silver looped earrings, that was Faith Paleologus. And that was the beginning of a whole new career. The earrings were the Well, key. that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. Now, <laughs> am I the only person who didn't know until recently that you were origin the originally going to play the Wicked Witch oh, in, uh, that story again. <laughs> in uh, Wizard of Oz? Uh, no, uh, maybe you didn't know it. I, I guess it wasn't really very well known, because actually the woman who wrote the story about the making of the film called me in Hollywood and said, I understand you had been playing and you didn't get the role and did you feel terrible? Were you very upset? And I said, upset? <laughs> Heavens, the poet, do you want to hear the story? Sure. <clears throat> Is it interesting? Mm -hmm. um, I was set to do The Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz by Mervyn Leroy, who had discovered me, as you do when you come from New York and you've played things, you're discovered when you come to Hollywood, you see. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's amusing. It's um, another country there. It's another country. Um, so, they had the costumes were made, a high pointed hat with sequins and a slinky sequins black gown and green eyes and big lashes and all that stuff for a wicked, glamorous witch. And we had tested the clothes with Judy Garland. We were all there testing because it was ready to go. And Mervyn came to me with a long face and he said, oh, Gail, all, this, all the producers in the studio say, you can't do that, it's a, it's a classic. Children expect an ugly witch and the grown-ups expect an ugly witch. You can't do that, yeah. And, and so Mervyn said, Gail, I don't want you to play an ugly witch. And I said, Mervyn, I won't play an ugly witch. <laughs> so that's the story. I and always you said, to I will do not. The... Yes, I will. No, the they didn't give it to it? me then, but I, I, mm. I didn't, I wouldn't, I, I would have done it if they'd forced me. Yeah. But this is one thing in these wicked w roles that you speak of. I never played her ugly. If you look back over all the films That's I've right. done. That's right, they were always very glamorous. I played villains, against it, or... always. And it's much more intriguing if you don't know what a wicked woman who is. Well, I hate, to, I'm, I'm not, I'm modest, you know, but I'll say it, who is glamorous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they call me anyway, so I'm not making it up. No, you always no. have been glamorous. Well, I'm glad. I, I didn't understand that myself, just but, like I thought I didn't belong in motion pictures. Mm -hmm. I never really understood why people said those things about me. It's true. But it had to do with the philosophy of yours, that it's more effective to play evil mm -hmm. glamorous Absolutely. than to play... Yeah. S Absolutely. It's evil, evil, because right. they have nowhere well, to go. Well, sure. It, it's, uh, it, well, it's, yeah. it's, uh, well, I, I can't say, think any more words. <laughs> well, uh, what about the movie The Letter? That's certainly one, of, it's, a, it's a favorite in all film yeah, festivals. Well, and that was considered a one of the very classic films. Very interesting role to play for me. Yes, you play the Eurasian woman in That's that. Right. Mm -hmm. And in, mm -hmm. I think in the original, in, the song was written by Somerset Maugham, mm. that that was not such an important character. As I it, never as saw, I didn't read, film. I have to admit, I did not read Mom's uh -huh. story. I didn't want to. And I did not see the Gene Eagles version, so I didn't know how it was played. But when I read that and knew I was going to do it, I said, this was, I must say, before the civil rights movement became strong here. Mm -hmm. And people were not so conscious then of racial prejudice, and there was a lot of it. You know, it's true, until the surge came. And when I read that, 
And when they started bringing me in the wardrobe fittings, these horrible clothes that belonged just to a gutter woman. And this woman was married, had been married. The man who had had an affair with Betty Davis, who had shot him dead at the beginning of the film, had married me. I said, did yes. that mean that that man had gone to the dogs and become a nothing and that she was justified in killing him, shooting him dead because he'd married someone who was not all Caucasian? I said, was that, is that why you're going to dress me like that? And Willie Wyler, the director, said, I think we better go home and come back tomorrow. And we went home and came back tomorrow. And he said, I couldn't sleep all night for what you said. You're right. She must have the dignity of a woman, whether she's yellow or black or whatever she is. Mm -hmm. She is a woman, and she deserves all the dignity. And unfortunately, it's the white woman who was a murderess. <laughs> so your interpretation of it prevailed. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They brought in all the satins and the brocades and the beautiful Chinese things and designed them all for me. And all the way through, we were, you know, she had her dignity as a white woman who was suffering intensely from losing the man that she loved, you know, couldn't love her husband anymore. So that, you know, I understood her too. But I certainly didn't think that because a woman was only half Caucasian, that she was a lesser woman, you see? And that's how it would have turned out if you That's how it would have turned way. out, but I think, I think from what I hear, <laughs> I don't like to listen but that mom thought of her as, as, a, as a whore. He did. And that she, he had gone to the dogs. So that was the thinking of, some years back, I'm sure. You know? of racism in the original. Yes, yeah. I think so. And that's my theory anyway. But Ms. Sandergaard, what, what, what do you do next? What do I do next? You're in rehearsal. I'm in rehearsal, yes. Yes, for, for many, many years ago uh, that I played on Broadway. I was here three years ago at the Mark, at the, uh, I was about to say Mark Taper, <laughs> at the Roundabout Theater playing in an Ibsen play, John Gabriel Borkman, which was a wonderful experience for me in Ibsen, you know, tremendous. I enjoyed it so much. Is, it, is it ever discouraging thing. when someone sees you in Ibsen and then comes back and says, I just have to get your autograph because <laughs> the Spider Woman is my favorite Oh, movie. that's okay with me. It's all right. Oh, of course. No. It, it no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, embarrassed about any roles I've played at all. You might not be all right with Ibsen, though. He was yeah, rather humorless, I think. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think he could have been that humorous. I admire your foot gear. Oh, do you like them? Yes, those are wonderful. Do you well, ride? Those are the latest style. Yeah. <laughs> do I ride? Do you ride? In these boots I have In ridden. Those, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Gail Sondergaard, it's fascinating to see what you're like. Thank you for coming. Oh, fine. Okay. We, we, you we've run say out of what time. I'm playing in now. Goodbye, Fidel. Goodbye, Fidel. That's right. Right. Gail Sondergaard. That's the commercial. Pleasure meeting you. See you next time. Good night.